maybe over here. This year is another year for the government to prepare its budget. But prior to preparing the budget, the government has to prepare something that they refer to the strategic policy statement, the SPS, which is um, legally due by the first of May. So pretty much that's me parliament cable by the first of May. Um, the last strategic policy statement the government did was back in 2021, which by law, the government had to get done three months following the general election. I mean, at that time, we were still in a COVID type environment, the economy was still closed down, and we were looking at reopening and everything else. So the focus back then was pretty much getting the economy reopened, getting business back to normal. And as a new government coming in, green and everything else to some extent, we didn't get a chance to have as much public um, consult. And at that time, your strategic policy statement would have been primarily driven by your election manifesto and everything else. And that's one of the things that we looked at. As we start preparing now for the strategic policy statement for this upcoming budget for the next two years, I think it'd be in the best interest, at least for my ministry and for my team to at least come out, have a meet with them, the chamber members, to get the feedback in terms of, you know, and also provide an update in terms of, you know, what we have done so far, what it is that we're looking at, and then what it is ultimately you um, as the um, the a major community group within the um, the country in terms of getting your view, so we can incorporate some of those feedback into our strategic policy statement. That SP is actually a three year. Um, it covers a three year period, even though the budget may only cover two years. So I thought it would actually be important rather than to sit back in a caucus room with a group of politicians and uh, you know, what do we think it should be, but rather to come out and get feedback. that. Um, as I said before, um, many times or on many occasions, that one of the things that made KMA unique is that we developed at a very organic level. And when I say that, it means that in most countries, the, the natural order is in a community comes together for different reasons. When they start trading amongst themselves, they create an economy. And as the community grew and the economy grew, they create a political system. So the natural orders are always being community, economic, political. Other countries have gone in road where it has become a little bit reverse, where it becomes economic, political, and community. And that's the reason why um, the premier had a nice tagline for me to create this country, or my own tagline from a um, political standpoint, you know, one Cayman kind of thing. So the main thing that we want to do, and as I said before, is to ensure that Cayman remains a community-driven um, country. It remains a private sector-led economy. The minute we see around, and we have many examples of countries where the government step out of what their traditional role should have been, try to get themselves involved in things that they shouldn't have had, and it becomes a disaster. As I said, Jimmy Carter was the first US president to find out that the office of the president is there to preserve democracy. The Federal Reserve is there to preserve capitalism. So for us at this standpoint, it is before we I don't want to say the word be presumptuous to sit amongst ourselves. And I think the Minister of the is it next week. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have this feedback, this forum, before we sit down and start putting pen to paper with regards to the strategic policy statement, I just say SPS, for the next three years. So this is the reason why I asked for this meeting and also to give you guys an opportunity to have any questions, clarify any questions. This is the CNO management team within the Ministry of Border Control and Labor. And as they put together their own objectives, their processes, and everything else, it will also give them an opportunity to also add to the SPS at this point. So that is the real purpose of this meeting. But naturally, um, before I get started into the meat of it, I just want to provide a brief update on where we are with regards to finances. Um, as some of you may be aware, when the, um, the government came in, there's something we refer to as a preview, which is a pre um, an economic forecast, where at a the time they go through the public service to look at the trends and they said, you know, what it is that we're basically expecting to, um, to get into. When this government came in, the preview actually had us at a $98 million deficit for the 2021 financial year and a $59 million deficit for the 2022 financial year. When we came in, we realized that the $98 million excluded $35 million of stipend. So when the government started out, we, we added on these numbers start with 133, at least in the red, 133 million. And we came in, we took some um, steps within the civil service in terms of the 
um, reduce expenses as much as we could. We implemented a policy where anything around about five thousand dollars outside of your life, but that kind of stuff had to be signed up by a minister. So really kind of like tighten up on the cost, but at the same time now create an environment where at least the businesses can at least have some level of confidence in the game and economy. So for the 2021 financial year, the deficit was 133 million, it was 98 million, the deficit was actually 15 million dollars. So which was actually pretty good. Um, for 2022, we were looking at at the time a 15 million dollar deficit. And by changing, I guess, the culture to some extent, we were actually able to actually have a surplus um, for the 2022. And right now as it stands, and this is just preliminary numbers, we're looking at a surplus at around 47 million. So rather than a $59 million deficit in the red, we're now actually 47 million in the back. So that's a hundred million dollar turnaround um, for the 2022, hundred and something million turnaround for 2021. But overall, we have actually improved the forecast when we came into office by over $200 million. Um, the one number that I liked about last year, as uh, small as it may have been, is that our expenses in 2022 was less than 2021. I mean, naturally we had more COVID related expenses, but the one thing that actually is a concern for my colleagues is still the pace of growth within the government and its expenses. So to put that in very layman's term, in the last five years between 2018 and 2022, we increased expenses by over $301 million, but we only increased revenue by $182 million. And for most of you as business people recognize that something record as negative jobs. If your percentage increase in expenses is going, going faster than the percentage increase in revenues, at some point, you when those lines intersect, it, you, it's very difficult to uncross them. And bear in mind that we're still a service-based economy, we're still a consumption-driven economy, and the government derives its taxes from the private sector. We can't have government expenses growing faster than the private sector is growing. That in itself is a recipe for long-term disaster. So we wanted to at least start out here where we can just get the feedback from you guys in terms of as we plan for the next three years and pretty much you know, um, open the floor for, from that standpoint. So we have the director of work here, who's um, German, he's going to be quite popular today. Well, the director for Labor and Pension, well, Mr. Charles Gifford from CBC in terms of customs and everything, and Chief Officer Wes Howell and David that actually pulls all the different things from the different departments together. So rather than listen, I'm a politician, I got three and a half hours of talk time. I can go through this, but the purpose here is actually to get feedback from you all ultimately, because we we most of the employees and the greatest friend of employee is an employer. We don't have one of those, you know, working the volunteer. So with, with that said, I think that is pretty much my opening um, speech for this forum, Michelle the senior. You don't use a tall time. You don't use a tall time. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't put in the spot like that. You know what I mean? But so, with that said, um, Mr. President, yeah. I'm chief officer, and about the ones that had anything on. So I'm just happy that the team is happy to be here and to engage and to hear and to talk to discuss about how well we can continue to work together. Yeah. Well, thank you again for coming. Um, EP and the rest of the group. Um, I think we're going to start off with the executive committee of the chamber asking a few questions and then we'll open the floor to any of our members that want to start. So. I think we said it right, Mr. Slot is going to be popular today. <laughs> <laughs> um, work permit processing time we're experiencing is 14 to 24 weeks. What measures are being taken to reduce processing time to allow business to come to the okay. So afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, it was anticipated that that would be a, a focal point. Um, I, I can say in comparison to uh, last year, we were, so we have different work permits. I'm not sure if that's referencing grants or annuals. Um, and, and if it is, we have in fact improved the process in times comparative to last year. We were ranging from four to six months on annuals. Uh, right now, um, for the last quarter of 2022, for this first quarter, um, we're down to three months. Um, and we have a few measures in place um, with an injection and a change of business process with administrators. Uh, predominantly, um, as you know, that there are two boards for um, it, the business staff and plan board and the work permit board. Um, but they have a, a limitation to their bandwidth and how often they meet per month or per week. Um, so with that injection and a change in business process, 
um, we're desirous of actually bringing that down to another month um, and minimizing that to at least a month and a half, two months uh, business processing time. Um, we would like to add uh, more to the pool um, to increase that efficiency. And we are aware um, that it does in fact um, limit at times, especially where we recently changed the, uh, where the regulations as of the 31st of March for temporary work permits, which obviously are desired. Uh, we're, we're now requiring that to be advertised uh, 14 days uh, consecutively before the temporary work permits are actually submitted. And the whole idea of that, again, um, uh, supporting the broader outcomes of um, the minister and the government is to increase visibility uh, for Caymanians in the job market and have that visible. When we look at actual numbers, we're actually seeing that temporary work permits uh, make up about 50% of the overall applications that we actually process on any given month, much less any given year. Um, but as I mentioned, we are working towards improving uh, those processing times for annuals. And we'll continue to work with the board in relation to that. We do have some numbers that I can share as well. Um, but the boards are in fact working feverishly um, to push those out to work from the board in itself per month can push out up to 400 plus applications. Uh, business app and plan board can push out close to 200 plus. Our administrators really are, are the resource, um, which are delegations given by me that can actually push up up to 1,200 applications per month. So hence the reason I'm focused on administrators because they have a full day um, every day, five days a week, uh, focus on actual processing of applications. So we're continually working on improving that. One of the, so one of the things I want to add, um, and I think that's from a policy standpoint, because at the end of the day, the department will carry out whatever policy the government is looking at. One of the things um, that we make sure that we do, um, and at least from a policy standpoint, is that that unit operates independently of any political um, interference or anything. So to give an idea, when we came into office, this is what finance, typical finance cabinet movie looked like in terms of thickness or whatever content. This is actually what the finance mode looks like today, each month with the cabinet. Now, included in this is pretty much a mini annual report for every single entity. So for us, we can see how much um, decisions that the board, will, the different boards will make. And at that point, I can say to the chairperson, well, I see all they're doing X amount this month, last month you did that. Do what happened to your meetings? You know, was there a situation? Was there a lack of support? So we allow them to basically operate like that. But two things that we want to get done is one is an automated system <clears throat> where we're trying to get the accreditation finalized and literally have AI literally process as much. So if you are an employer, and you're pretty much on a green list, then that can be reflected in your process in time. What is actually missing um, or should, should, from most people's consideration is that we also do, it, do have employers that are actually fine. No, that do, that, that do receive fine. Um, in fact, I think of the press release coming out shortly with the latest um, one that will be looked at in cabinet recently. I think last year, we had 153 breaches, um, memory certain, right? Yeah, yeah, about 153 breaches last year. I think it was about trillion or something that was lost in five. Yeah. When we do look at the quote unquote red list in terms of employers who have been fined, who have been caught, naturally you would have to expect that. If we have caught you doing something, then the scrutiny will have to um increase. So sometimes we do hear some people complain of the first thing I used to say to my colleagues when they come to me, ask them if they have been fined. We're talking about maybe easily four to 500 employers that have been fined on island. And people need to understand that. And that it is a process that once we catch you, it is going to be a problem. I can tell you, I, I don't see all the work from that approved, but I do see technically by approving the batches for the refund, I get a chance to see everybody who was basically been refused or even overpaid a permit because I signed a batch. And they can tell you, I look at that batch with a fine to comb, and if need be, I'd be like, wait a minute, why did this happen or why did that happen? Can you take a look at that? So it is a situation where, and there are unscrupulous people out there. Now, data protection don't allow us to name and shame them. It is a small community, we're not going to do it. 
And I mean, the director is being polite, but I can tell I'm the politician. I don't have to share this polite as he is, but it is a problem. And one of the things that we want to push with an accreditation program, but we do recognize that some of these mistakes could have been, and but by mistake, it could have been a general mistake. It could have been anything on school plus. What we want to do is when we get the accreditation process finalized, and I think over the next couple of months, we can have it done. I can probably ask the chain what to sit with us before we put something in to say, well, these are what it is that we're looking at. These are the metrics that we'll be looking at and say, you know what, when is zero o'clock? So if you're a bad employer in the past, we're giving you a clean slate. This is a new regime, a new opportunity for us to look at things differently. But you got to recognize that once we do catch you, it's not going to be a situation where your permits are going to be very, very easy to process. I do expect the work team to start looking at things a little bit more carefully at that point when you've been caught. You know, so but hopefully the automation process will get that um even much easier because. It's about what, five, six thousand decisions that the that they are on the work department process is per month. And when you consider that the team is still a small team, and you know, we I talked earlier about you know increasing government arm expenses. It's very easy to throw bodies, but then you gotta think about the rent and additional costs and all that kind of stuff. It's just not gonna work. So, you know, Minister Brian, welcome. By if you already say about tourism, then why did they So I know they would say yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um after everyone, I um ask Minister Brian. I told him about his being in French. Yeah. Sorry. I like the Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I um I told Minister Brian about this meeting also and recognizing that he got, his team is also working on your strategic policy statement. It will also provide a forum for him also. As a tourism related business and also with transport, but I didn't minister. Sorry if there's any feedback. So you will see other um, ministers probably doing something similar, but in a different forum. But in terms of trying to get feedback from the public at this point, as you put together our three year strategic policy statement. So those are the kind of things that we also have to factor in is the four or 500 people that actually sit on the Irish register to some extent of repeatedly trying to find a way to start the system. It's a sad reality, but it is a part of business and businesses actually do it. And if I may um, maybe add in here as well. So the other evening I was in the supermarket and I looked at the, the regular checkout line and they were blocked up. And I looked at the items in my car and I was one item over from the express. So I put one item back and get another time <laughs> and took the express. Now the synergy between that and what we do is when we get a flood of temporaries, I mean 30,000 temporaries, we were actually touching people applications twice sometimes three times and we do a three month and a six month that we do the grant we want to get better at processing the grants so that you don't have to do temporaries and for us you touch once um, and it means that temporaries will become legitimate emergencies and the other grants will go through much faster so that is the game plan that's why the advertising for temporaries coming in it solves two issues one is that uh, the, the card wasn't balanced. If you do a temporary, you don't have to advertise. If you do a grant, you do. Um, advertising gives Kim Myers an opportunity to see what's available work wise. And it also levels the playing field between temps and grants. So as we get better with the grants, you, you'll fight for less temps. The express line will be truly express, <laughs> and the other line will work efficiently. So on that um, point, we have one more question. Yeah, just to follow up on your So, what would be the time that you're looking at to get? It down on the processing time now too much. So with there's there's a couple approaches, obviously. If we're speaking of the temps, um, we're also speaking of um, admin an administrator there. And you want to do that. It's expected at least within the next three, three months sure. um, that we would actually have that reduced. Thank you. And um, just following up on the express line question on that, I mean, <laughs> um, the temporary work permits, if we have genuine consultants coming in for a set period of time, is it expectation we have to advertise those as well? There are some exemptions that can be granted um, and applied for. You still have the um, uh, visitor work visa um, facility through um, CDC, which is a quick turnaround. Um, so like that's for 30 yeah. days or less. That's for 30 days or less. And the business visitor visa still exists as well for uh, repeated um, short term engagement. So there's a number of facilities there. These were consultants that, that you're speaking of. So yeah. consultants would actually be on that list. 
and ASHA consultants would um, have a waiver of, of up to six months okay. as well. So there are certain specified categories that okay. would, would be um, exempt from those um, advertising requirements. Thank you. But there's one thing I want to add to that, and again, for the person we're going to arm raise with um, my people, is that there are businesses on island that are bringing in consultants or quote unquote overseas disguised employees providing a service for that people in this very room can provide. And when you have someone flying in to paint a property or do some, some simple little stuff that can be done here, that is a problem too. Because at the end of the day, our first and foremost is ensure that the businesses there in Cayman have a level playing field. And some people, I can tell you, have literally, we have, we have seen it, where they are literally flying in an electrician to come in and do something and saying as a consultant, when in fact they're actually doing work that can be done by businesses here on island. And for those businesses, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to ask if you're watching or whatever, stop it. That needs to stop. I mean, we have seen it, and the thing about it is this, how it actually came on my radar when another minister in a different country called me up and said, by the way, do you know that this company is actually doing this? And I'm like, really? So when I went, made my own queries, sure enough, that company was a branch in Cayman, it's doing exactly the same thing. I mean, we're still here to protect Cayman and businesses first and foremost. The government is one of the largest purchasers of goods and services. The government can go out, and buy stuff from overseas that be cheaper, but it does not help the local economy. Our job is to keep as much money, as much business as we can locally. And I mean, yes, we know things are tight, but at the end of the day, in the longer term, it arms our overall economy. I mean, there's still a cost of doing business. And yes, you can get cheaper prices, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not something that's little. And I, I find it hard to see businesses flying in electricians when there are electricians on island that can actually do this kind of job. And again, hopefully once we get that accreditation process in, we can zero the slate and some of these bad behaviors can actually stop happening. But you can't be doing that. You know, not when people are paying their fees, employing and employing people and all that kind of stuff. We can't do that. There's one follow-up question on the accreditation system. Do you have a time frame for when it will be implemented? We are open um, before the end of June. Um, but we want to get it tied up in terms of when we can have some level of automation. It's definitely not for this year. Um, one of the things I can tell you <clears throat> that I'm pushing for, and regardless of what people may have said about the national ID system, is that you know, once we get something like that launch, we want where you can actually come to the airport, you're literally free clear, just grab your bags and go kind of thing custom a lot of different stuff. I mean, but at the same time, the airport is still a point for smuggling. You know, we still need to make sure, but we want everything to be risk-based from that standpoint. The last thing we want is tourists coming inside here and spending two, three hours clearing and all different kind of stuff when we can do some stuff in the background before. It's about really working more smarter, using technology and everything else, and to try to make people's lives a little bit better. I, I can share that every one of the agencies on the ministry um, DLP, CDC, were are compiling a list of registers of those who've been um, the high risk persons, whether that be passengers, businesses, pension payments, labor issues, um, work permit um, infractions. So the stick part of the accreditation is already underway and it's influencing how business is being done across the ministry now. And what we find is when you find somebody uh, reaching labor laws, they like to reach in CBC laws as well as the immigration laws as well. So that information is great. Um, it allows for synergies across the ministry, but it then allows us to now focus on those who are doing everything good and are going above and beyond. And that's the next step in relation to that easier process and um, pass it through. But risk based is what we have to do. Um, Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Um, what is the government's plans to address the skills gap in the workforce and ensure that workers have the necessary skills for the in-demand jobs? It's part one question. And part two, in particular, would be speaking to the conditions that were on regulation six when applying for work permits. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I do have an issue when people talk about the skills gap. And I can explain to you why, why I have a personal issue with it. 
we have the kids that will come out of school there locally. And then we're basically being told that they can't get a job because our education system is inadequate. But yet, when they do go to the universities in North America and Europe and come back, they still can't get a job. No, because all of a sudden they become overqualified or something else. The whole idea behind education isn't to make you employable, it's to make you trainable. And being trainable is what it is that makes you employable. And like with anything else, I can tell anyone, and I'm sure everyone in this room at some point, before you reach where you reach, you are at an entry-level position and you upskill yourself, you drive yourself and so forth. No, and I was going to speak politically right now, is that we have created a disconnect in this country for years or for decades where we have said to Caymanians that, oh, is, is a work with a hold of our business job to train and develop Caymanians. No one has ever sat down before arriving in the Cayman Islands and said, honey, hope to God when I get a job in the Cayman Islands, I'm going to settle down, I'm going to send for you and the kids or whatever. And then after two, three years, I'm going to train somebody to take my job and come to Raleigh to go back. That conversation don't happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is an attitude and attitude issue that I think not a work skills um, issue, but an attitude and attitude issue that we need to work on, especially with our younger people. And in some cases, and people who are young at heart to some extent, because at the end of the day, I can tell you, I've had a job where I have walked into with zero experience other than having the right attitude and aptitude, and I've done kind of well. And when people sit down and I'm seeing now where basic entry level jobs are requiring in some cases a bachelor's degree, which we know is student language BS, because it is entry level for a reason, then that becomes a problem. You know what I mean? And like with any employer, you take on somebody, you could have come out of Harvard. If they come and work for seven fathoms, the first week they're going to still sit down, they're going to be learning what it is that you want them to learn. We expect this is where this relationship comes in between both the private sector and also within the public sector in the terms of what it is that we can do. Now, when we do look at areas where there is a genuine, um, I don't want to say skill gap, but an unavailability of the resources. So you take, for example, Plumbers. There is a genuine shortage, at least in my opinion, I could be wrong, in terms of plumbers. You look at the AC techs and so forth. So when we look at the, the list of all the different work permits and we can see where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. I mean, my fact, just today I was looking at my own um, annual report from, uh, from the Ministry of Finance. And of the 163 staff, we had 148, I believe, were Caymanian. Nice start. I said to those guys, well, I'm still in Minister Labour, still have immigration. What do I need to do to get this hundred? Turns out that the majority of the, um, the work permits is in one pretty much department and then in terms of economic and statistics. And then the question is, how many Cayman is do I have? That's in economics and statistics, the kind of thing. So I recognize that gap in terms of un unavailability. But now what we need to do is go to incentivize people to get into those different jobs that really is some level of job security or whatever. But you know, when I do see, no, I expect some organization, and I don't want to like put the writs on, on thing there, but they have a certain standard that somebody coming out may not necessarily have it because in, on top of all of that, there's a certain attitude I know that's like with your workers or so forth, that that is something now that the parents have to focus on, the teachers have to focus on, the community has to focus on. Mm -hmm. There has to be a work ethic standard. And I can tell you, speaking politically, one of my biggest fears is Cayman becoming like Greece. No disrespect to the Greek people inside here versus how the Germans used to operate in terms of developing back that strong work ethic. Our four parents had it. They built this country. No one can argue from that standpoint. But to some extent, this is where the parenting and even the, 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 the community, everybody has to come together to skill, to instill a certain work ethic in people. And I think that is really more the issue as opposed to skill, it is more a, a work ethic. As I can tell you, some people out there who genuinely wants to work that still not given an opportunity. Um, I can say to you right now that based on the, um, the latest numbers that we have on our economic statistics, office with regards to the labor force survey, we have an unemployment rate of 2.1% overall for the country. But it came at an unemployment rate is 3.6%, which is even below the natural rate of unemployment. But of that, is of that 1,200 that we have that's kind of unemployed, 60% of them has been unemployed for more than um, 12 months. 
So for that, we can recognize that there has to be some adjustments that needs to be taken there. The government has worked with um, like Inspire Cayman and um, the Michael Smiles program and other programs. We last year we went to um, the visit the art um, in Jamaica to look at how we can actually work with them. They'll develop a very good vocational um, skill um, from that standpoint to see how can we kind of get certain things here on the vocational side. I mean, 1,200 is not a bad number, but it's still for me 1,200 too much. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, when someone don't have a job, it's taken from their dignity. When people sit at home and they see everybody that's going to work, that's something that you hear at them. And I can tell you, when you have family members and you see them family members and you see them people, I've seen it personally where men have literally felt like they literally want to kill themselves not being able to provide that's an issue and that is something for us and i'm gonna be honest with you for 1200 people with all the business that we have if every business even took one person and say you know what let me take this one person and do something with it we literally have zero unemployment and this is where we need to go as a community in a country we have a population that can fit in a stadium some of the problems that we have we're not supposed to be having some of them is just straight and i can tell you I mean, from private sector, your responsibility is shareholders. But at some point, you also have a responsibility to your stakeholders, which include the public at, at large. And I will say to businesses sometimes, be careful, you know, the cost of everything and the price of nothing. Because that one person that you could have given an opportunity to, that would have cost you thirty, forty thousand dollars or your million dollar profit line, may just be the person that decided to go a different path and come and take it from your one way. Because I can tell you, the prison sits in my um, neighborhood. I used to volunteer up there. And when you do speak to the, the, the inmates up there, they can justify their behavior as to why they did what they did. So some may be contrite, but some will sit down and say, well, society didn't want to give me a chance, so I take it. <laughs> and sometimes that's what it takes. In government, I can tell you, we, we, we sat down and we, we have set aside money to hire people that we know will have some level of challenges. I mean, we look at Evening Inclusion came on a wonderful organization doing great work. You know, I mean, we have taken care of the kids up to the 18, you know, through the different centers. What happened to them afterwards? Some organizations have done very well hiring people with disabilities. And some organizations that have resources to do it don't. And that we can't build a country like this. But anyway. Well, I want to prolong the answer, but I can say that as we wound down the board's perspective last year, the deputy premier and his colleagues made a decision that anybody doing TV training, uh, job reskilling, ought to be compensated at that same level, fifteen hundred dollars a month, as a stipend for completing successfully completing those programs, and the businesses locally benefit from that. So we're covering the base stipend, allowing them to focus on their training to get to the point that they can become an intern without impacting the cost of local businesses. The thing with the small and medium sized businesses, which makes a large um, percentage of our employment sector. So that will continue on right now in the process. What's the name of that program? It's a number of programs we're actually attending right now for, for GBED mm -hmm. and more of the white collar um, process as well. So one of the training programs, the pilot programs we have on, on technical vocational, corporate drivers, electricians, um, persons working in the tourism ministry, both captains, those sorts of things, as well as we're also partnered with one of the recruitment firms to connect with our college graduates and ensure that they have that introduction into the business community. Is that through the CIBD? Uh, no, it's going to be a separate exercise as well. Okay. Um, so those programs uh, operated quite well, upwards of 60% of the folks that went through were employed by the end of the program. And um, we, we intend to continue that going forward in 2022. So as soon as those um, tendering processes uh, wind up, we expect to award those contracts and have this machinery then that will be training and allowing um, smaller, medium-sized businesses to have a pool of Caymanians who are training the basics that you can then tweak for your um, benefit going forward. Thanks. So, uh, and that, that cost of the site is covered by the government. One of the things I want to add, and this is one of the reasons why I am truly eternally grateful to Minister Brian in terms of the energy that brought to tourism. When we sit back and we ask people, what was the biggest news in Cayman four days ago? Most people don't even remember. Here's what I want you to remember with. When we ended a stipend in June last year, you know what triggered up? 
burglaries. At one point, everybody in this country was worried about burglaries. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing. Stipend, we got the um the briefing from the police. And the first thing I said to those guys when they had all these different suspected people, I said to my colleagues, go and look and see if one of these people is against stipend. And all of a sudden the tourism boom came around. The burglars are here more than another one. And this is the reason why every chance I get to give them his props, I give them his props. Is that it goes to show that once we have the opportunities and people have an opportunity to make money legally, then they don't want to be going into anybody else. Because everyone in this community at some point last year was freaking out about the number of burglars. But no one sat down and said, he had in this type of no, at some point, I can tell you, we, we sat down and we calculated it is cheaper to run these programs, being $1,500 a month, because it's still cheaper than overtime that the police had to use to try to do all of this stuff. And again, that's why I said someday to be careful you know, to cost everything and the price of nothing. So that, those are the, the decisions that we as a government have to look at. You no, know, burglars went away, everybody went on the mirror business, but we still remain cognizant that these opportunities aren't here. The burglars can come back, and burglars is about the business. You know. Thank you. Yes, sir. If, if you would allow it. Yeah, well, please, please, Minister. Good afternoon, everybody. I do apologize for my lateness. Um, I'm so encouraged every time that we are having this communication with you to ask the government question. Uh, I like to do things a little differently. I need to ask you some questions. Um, there's a number of things before us, and I would love some feedback so, so, so I can go back uh, with my colleagues to consider. Uh, so I'll put three things out there. Anybody who's triggered to respond that give me an idea of how the change of land is going to go in this field. One, the looming problem with the cargo board. Ten years, we won't be able to go. Many of you survive based on importation. Secondly, the Panama trip and the flight. Are you happy about it? It's an opportunity from a major port where many of our importations come from. And lastly, um, the, map, the vaccination requirements for work permit holders, uh, residency, and uh, status. Obviously, the, the COVID. Um, safety concerns is not as prominent as they once were, but they're still real. Um, is there a different view as to whether that should be mandatory now? Still, um, if we have no positions on either one of those, it's fine. I'll continue to gauge it as I go, but I'd like to get a feedback from, from those who are involved. Do anybody have any viewpoints on any one of those? I appreciate it. Actually, yes, I feel that the vaccination requirement in an environment where it's hard enough to get skilled labor is putting another roadblock in front of us. So personally, I would like to see the vaccination requirement be And I second that. I'm with Just show some hands. <laughs> think that I can happily <laughs> this Thank you. Call on Monday that I tried to ask that you to encourage my colleagues that we need to now move away from that. And I appreciate that. And I think that if I can get a letter from the chamber president, of course, encouraging that the government needs to do so because we don't know everything in that caucus room. And we depend on your feedback. We're over here to represent you. Never forget that word. That means we act on your behalf. So until you tell us, we won't know. I can't think for you. I can't get into your brain. So if you feel strongly, voice it. That's how we represent. We, we want to hear from you. Scream if you have to. That's the good part about having an organization like this. And the other two topics. Yeah. Yes. Yes. On the Panama trip. Um, forgive my ignorance. Is there is there a a conference that's being set up to um, provide information to the uh, Panamanian companies that uh, we're trying to engage them and is there, is there any, anything that you're planning there? I, I don't, but we're in the formulation yeah. of going through that exercise now and interestingly enough, Sir, there's, a uh, plan. there's a treatment model plan. Is, we did one uh, several years we'd ago. We'd love to know about it. <laughs> we did four We did four of them okay. <laughs> yeah. previously. Yeah. Perfectly, but so, so we're igniting some of those things back, particularly with the very first launch. 
Um, and there's going to be a letter to the, to the chain president shortly Good. about including uh, them in the first trip yeah. and having those yeah. stakeholders yeah. over there to meet and have a function for the first trip, as you did the last yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Um, and obviously, I've always said that the chamber has to be involved. And I'm mm -hmm. you to say there is influence with um, Minister J from uh, importation with um, agriculture and so forth. So you won't hear the last of that. I just want to get the trip off the ground first and then start doing the other steps. So just so that you know, online, the feedback has been one person said about the vaccination. It says agreed, especially if visitors do not need to be vaccinated. I kind of thought so, but I just want to confirm. Um, cargo, port, and it's reality that we're facing. I know the Senate did one, but I like to get ahead of things. So, so I, I've read the report, I think, that it was sent out, and it, it's the cargo port was looking to be set in, what was it, Bottom Town? It, it made some that's, that's the most. And that was an internal report done by the uh, then director, Joseph Woods, mm -hmm. um, and it was based on preliminary um, assertions. Um, and the recommendation came out for the new breakers after considering a number of locations. Obviously, that's not a hard, fast location. It's a recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result, I'm putting up for further analysis mm -hmm. for the government to consider. Uh, ultimately, and I'm not going to get caught up in the, the fight about the environment and all that. My job is oh. to report is to ensure that when I work on the job, whether I'm going to be here in 2025 or not, I brought it to the attention of the country. And we have a problem from a food security perspective. And in the timeline it takes to get it resolved, we got to start talking about it now. <laughs> if all of us decide to say, nah, we're cool. After that limit gets there, we can't do anything else, then that's fine. My job is to represent you. I just want feedback, right? I don't want to get in a fight with anybody. No. I, I just want to do my job on behalf of the So we have to start giving the leaders feedback about these types of things. So I know that the LCL cargo has been a problem at the port recently mm -hmm. uh, because of some delays there. Is that uh, the reason behind it is because of the, the cargo issues that you're having currently? Uh, I wouldn't want to comment on that unless I have the full details. I'm going to set myself off that, but I know we have some growth problems at our location, but I don't think that's specific. Okay. I'm not really Give you some of the yeah. So, not much thoughts on the cargo then. No, we think it's important. We just need to keep talking. Um, thank you, DP. No problem. Yeah, just to, to bring it back to a little bit of labor stuff that we were doing. Um, so, we have one more question from the exec, and then I guess we'll open it up to the floor. Um, but uh, so. I think it's a follow up to the 1200 unemployed Caymanians. Mm -hmm. um, do you have statistics on applications on work and how that's going? What is it? Sorry, no, in in terms of for the jobs that are posted, do you have statistics on how many are applying, how many get interviews? Yeah, 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 yeah we actually do. Those that are registered, yes, we do. Um, some, for whatever reason, um, again, choose not to, um, to register. Away. And this is why it's important for us to get that database up. In terms of everything that's available, because what we also found is that you know people are using the temporary system to kind of test drive employees and all that kind of stuff, which is not what the temporary system was designed for. You know, but it, it is the short answer is yes. But again, we do recognize that some of them, as um skills issue, will go back to the same attitude and aptitude. And to be fair, some also have other issues that requires counseling. And I mean, some have substance abuse issues that require counseling. So we can't in good conscience sit down and say to someone, well, I that person, when we know the first week they may show up and then you don't see them again. I mean, so there are other underlying issues out there. I mean, like I said, the 3.6, 2.1% is unemployment number. Many countries around the world will kill it for. A 3.6% came out an unemployment number is a good number. But what I can say that we are concerned about is more an underemployment. There are people in Cayman that are qualified. Where your parents have mortgage your house to go to school, 
And if you look, come back and do an entry level job. Now, granted, you have to start somewhere, but there are some employers out there that are just outright, downright unscrupulous, who just outright have no intention of giving some people some opportunity. And this is one reason why we're actually looking at the Fair Employment Commission. So, if a business is applying for a permit for, to give a, a foreigner job and the permit is turned down, they have an appeals process in which they can actually go through and even an appeal it or judicial review that decision, like, I want that person here, oh dear, you stop me, kind of thing. But then what happens to the K-man who get discriminated on the job? Who do they appeal to? You know, so these are the kind of things that we need to sit down. Now, I'm not going to sit down and tell you that this was an original idea of mine. They've, and to give Jack his jacket, the first time it was actually announced in Parliament was by the former Premier, who also had this ministry. And the idea was sound. We supported it then. And, you know, whereas it went nowhere, the idea was still sound. And we are now looking at in terms of not to introduce new legislation, but amend current, current legislation to at least have that because it is a problem. And I can tell you, when you do read some of the letters of what some of the people go through, some people in this country really need to be ashamed of themselves. Because those are still people, parents, and they're still people, children that they need it with. And the one thing that we are focused on as a government is closing that dignity gap. Every single one of us has a role, every single one of us has a purpose. But we also have a right to be treated with a certain amount of respect and dignity. And I mean, people apply to your organization, not answering them is not cool. And I mean, not going through the process is not cool. And one thing that I really want to thank the work department for is the enhanced scrutiny that they have been putting on now on a lot of different stuff. And that is one of the things that I would love the accreditation process to do away with it because it forces us to even look at some businesses that don't need to be looked at. And this is why we want to make sure that those who should get the stick get the stick. But those who are doing right should not be treated the same way. And that is where we're trying to really get that separation. And like I said, we may make five, 6,000 decisions a month, but there's sometimes the paperwork is inadequate. Sometimes they take two, three times. That is more touch points, as the chief officer said. So while you may see five, 6,000 decisions, you may talk anywhere from 15 to 20,000 touches. And then that's per month. And I mean, you, 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 you analyze that, that is a problem. And I mean, so th this is exactly where it is that we want to get to from that standpoint. It will make it much easier. I hate the fact that we have to go through it and do all of that kind of stuff. When you're going to talk about the good stuff, the bad, but it is a sad reality of business that we're in. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Would you have some? I've got some from online. So the first one, I guess, is to Jeremy. Is, is there a dedicated person who will turn around waiver requests quickly? Yeah, so there was a question in, on my first appearance um, last week on radio. Um, and it was the reason why, if, if it was presented in December, the change, um, why is it just kind of coming out now? Which obviously there was a, a uh, I guess, a, a clarity and clarification that was actually provided, which was that we actually really did go out uh, through different media sources and provide that answer and provide public relations as to what's coming, what they expect. Um, but in short, yes, we will actually have um, the team available, administrators actually available, and process and correct available to address those. Uh, we're also looking at um, identifying in, we received further directions uh, by cabinet in relation to how that discretion is to be utilized. So not only is it um, open to, uh, it's, not, it's not open to full discretion, it has parameters and qualifiers as to how that is supposed to be applied. Um, but we will have administrators and processing clerks dedicated to that service and understanding that the turnaround times for that is critical, um, as well as looking at um, an added policy that complements that direction um, that will capture uh, personal employees and workers, which I think a lot have uh, been accustomed to not requiring waivers uh, for those. So understanding and being able to support that direction um, with creating an internal policy um, that will not necessarily blanket waivers, but give um, a standardized direction and how to apply that. The next one is, is good afternoon ministers and attendees. We're experiencing a few difficulties. Cancellations are not steadily inputted 
and reflected in IOL. I guess that's your yeah. Is not it's it, IOL is not updated with correct work permit expiry dates. Letters received having differing dates when cancellations are not processed, then refunds are delayed. Can this be looked into? Sure, I can't. I can't say that I was familiar with the identified um, grievance or, or concern, but I'll definitely um, communicate with the head of finance on that and look at actually remedying that. Can I just add some flesh onto that? Okay. I actually had a cancellation I put through online. Okay. Turned up because the girl then decided she did want to join, and they said, "Well, you, the work permit's still running." I went, "No, I've cancelled it. Here's the cancellation." Okay. But it hadn't actually registered in your system, even though I'd filed it online and got a confirmation online. Okay. saying it was done so there's a something going on with this is for I, I will um add to the direction that we've actually taken is that is to actually focus clearly on um the internal processes as it relates to cancellations so the team um is actually restructured in a way that actually addresses the efficiency of cancellations as well much less the quality yeah, the, the physical submitting the form online not actually registering it in the system Correct. So there's a some correct. So we'll I'll definitely take a look at that. One of the things we'll I um want to remember is them to be where we are. More than 90% of work permits are still being approved. Now, coming weeks ago, you guys would have seen the stir in the community where I think there was a CNS store, the number of work permits, where people started going crazy. Then they blame that for traffic, they blame that pretty much right, for every single thing. And maybe there is some relationship there, I don't know. But the point that I'm making is this, 90% is still being approved. Now, when people say to us that, oh, we're going too fast or we need to cut back, first thing I'll ask is, okay, where you want us to cut back in construction, tourism, financial services, where you want us to cut? And the next question is, okay, who do we cut? Which business we say, well, you can't get any more versus this or that. And that in itself does make that opening a door that you can never ever close. Because every single permit, in some cases, I should say that most permits are legitimate where there is a need. There are some people out there who are acting as labor brokers. It is iron permit, willing and pack up, and then try to farm people out. And I mean, we when we came in, there was a massive backlog, even on a um, I think issues before the, the Labour Appeals Tribunal. And I just reckon, I just noticed the chairperson of the Labour Tribunal, um, was three says there. And they have a small committee, but I can tell you they have cleared a lot of the backlogs. I mean, Teresa, I want to publicly, I was just speaking to West, was it, um, was it yesterday we were speaking? Yeah. Was it yesterday? Yeah. The day before. I was even asking about the different backlogs and do we need more people? Do we need more tribunals? And he said, no. Teresa has been doing a very good job with it. And so, to I really want to publicly thank you from that standpoint. But what it also still goes to show is that there are still issues between employers and employees. That, that, that is, the, and even with 90% being approved, we can complain about the 10% that is not. Now, I can tell you guys politically, you guys are going to understand one thing, and I speak as a politician. The people on work permits aren't the voters in this country. And when the voters can't get opportunities, or feel like they are denied opportunities because um, some employers in society don't want to give them a chance. These people vote. And while you do have politicians like myself and many of my colleagues and Minister Brian, who will constantly be moderate, there's still an environment for that political demagogue to come in. And woe be to the Cayman Islands and everybody else when a slate of political demagogue comes in that is just pure on emotion, pure on anti-expat, anti-everything, anti-you name it, this place will change. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I say, we gotta find a balance and we gotta find a way to work together to make sure our people get opportunities because the opportunity you deny them, they can take it out on the ballot box and you don't want to see who they want to send. So I just want to bear that in mind because I can tell you, are we as politicians deal with the other quote unquote political wannabes. And some of them scare me. And people come to the B radical, it's the same. You scare me, don't ask me who I scare them. You know, so I am telling you. And not many people scare us either. Yeah, some of them scare us. 
There are several of them online, but if there's anybody in the room that has yeah. any questions. Yeah. There's not. Yeah. Um, I just want to know, as businesses, is there anything we can do to prepare for the accreditation system or program that we can start in? So we've, we've had this discussion with smiling <laughs> about accreditation probably going back eight, ten years. Um, like I said, we, we are at the point now that, I, and I know that from the reports that I get in and, and from the work that I'm seeing, that CDC is trudging ahead and is able to keep pace. You would remember during the COVID lockdown, we had issues with people not getting their shipments on time and all that. That is not behind us, even though our imports are up significantly, as the Senator said. And a large extent of that is that they're not using their intelligence to say these importers are, are top of the line, low risk, high volume folks. These ones over here, that's where our risk is. So they're focusing the risk where it needs to be and, and are able to go that, that route. Where we struggled, um, and I must say this is on the benefit side, other than the streamlined processing, we were struggling as to how we would benefit um, the top performers for going above and beyond and being excellent employers around um, and very good for the game balance as a whole. Um, and that's one of the areas where I think the political arm can help us um, make those those bits work. But we are definitely building out um, our, our, our systems to track those who are doing really well. And those that, that, that need some more attention. Wes, do you have it in a, a kind of a, a document form that maybe you could share with the Chamber Council? That yes, they can we, provide feedback to we, you. We can definitely share the, the, the early work that we did, plus the additional work that we're doing on, on that. Great. The, the thing about it is this we have this thing in government where we try to make the um the enemy the perfect the perfect the enemy of the good. We don't want to get it right the first go. And I was like, you know, guys, let's launch it and then we fix it as we go. Because it is a social issue, and it will always change in terms of what a priority is today versus what a priority is last year. And if you keep changing every time you look at a document, the priority changes. You look at it again, something else changes. You know, and I'm like, you know, let's just get it out the door, and then we leave ourselves in the flexibility enough that if something changes, we can change along with it too. You know what I mean? But let's just get it started now. So it has been just dragged off for too long right now. And like I said, we have good employers. That are literally paying the price for bad employers. And the vast majority, I will tell you, are people who are legitimate businesses, but the system is designed to catch those unscrupulous ones and unfortunately we're applying the filters across literally everybody. And that's what we need to focus on. So I'm determined as a minister to get it out um, at least by Q2 or Q3 of this year. And then we just fix it as we go or tweak it as we go. Well, I think she said but I'm sorry. My, my question is very much to what you just you just spoke on, rolling out a process um, and just fixing it as you go. We've seen that backfire several times. You know, you'd go in and you say, "Oh, we have a new system," but nobody seems to know how the system works. Nobody seems to have any idea how to fix it or provide information. And the other issue I have is government as a whole, its employees, what steps are you as, as a committee taking to ensure that you as government are providing good service to the people who utilize those services? Well, you know, two things. Let me just answer one thing here first. <laughs> when we said the system, we're not talking about like the IT system. We're talking about the parameters that we use to determine the yep. good employer. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, we already have a set criteria that we know we can use. Now, in the next six months, something else may pop up. Then you can say, well, maybe this should be added to it. But either we we can't be waiting to get it extremely perfect, and then at the same time our businesses suffer because at the end of the day we're still a service based economy, and waiting three months to get a work permit approved when you're moving at a speed of business is completely inadequate. So we can't have a situation now where we have all of these filters to try to catch everybody when in fact there's only a few that we should be focusing on from a risk standpoint. So, like you said, it's been around for 10 years we've been talking about it. And this government came in, we look at what the last government did, we're like, okay, here, yeah, don't add this on. You know what I mean? No, every time I look at the document, there's something else I can think to add. But again, because it is a variable science, it's a social science, you will never get, because you can't predict where behaviors will be. You know what I mean? So it's, a, it's from that standpoint. Now, in terms of the other side of the question, in terms of um, what the government is doing, I can speak. I guess with my ministries, and in fairness to the deputy governor who isn't there, 
um, France, he has been doing an extremely good job in terms of building that world-class um, civil service. What I can say that we as the elected government is doing is giving them the resources, giving them the money. And I can tell you, I've had this conversation with West when we do have our conversation in terms of our own training, development, and everything else within the, um, the different department. Now, the challenges, and this is why the automation part is really important. Going back to work, using work as an example, five, 6,000 decisions a month. And the paperwork is inadequate. Sometimes they one, two, three times to get it right. You're still talking about 20,000 touch points. When you do go inside there and you're seeing people giving up their weekends, people working late at night, at some point there's a burnout element. So it is in also in our best interest. Is it an A, as Minister of Finance, I go find more money, hire more staff, to pay more rent, or be find a way to automate the system. And also at the same time, give those people a certain quality of life. Because one thing I'm going to say too, some of those staff work extremely, extremely, extremely hard. And some of the abuses that they take on the job from some people who believe that there is a right that I put in my permit this week, I should get it next week, kind of thing. That also needs to stop because first and foremost, if you look at that law, similar to the pension law, it is there for the people of the Cayman Islands and it's there for the employees of the Cayman Islands. First and foremost, it is about us protecting the different employees. And I'll be the first to tell you, there is a Minister of Commerce who is designed to do all this stuff with business people. I'm not it. I'm the Minister for the Employees. I'm the Minister for the Labor. But as I said, part of me doing my job is to interact with their employers because the greatest friend of my employee is still an employer. Because like I said, we don't want to do is you're not working, you're volunteering. So, I can say to you, as a Minister of Finance also, I need an environment for businesses to do well. I love the fact that we have a very low unemployment rate. You know, it then reduces crime and people can go around spending money and the economy continues well. But it's still a consumption base. And I can tell you what I tell my colleagues. We can look at the Cayman Islands overall, the rate that we have. We have the same rate as the United Kingdom, W3. We do not have the luxury of going into a back room like every other developed country and print money. We have to manage what it is that we have. And despite having a population that can fit inside a stadium, you know what doesn't change? Basic governance. If you go back and you look at all, out of all the government boards, all the government departments, and all the government entities, you know what we're talking about? Anybody have an idea? Over 300, over 300 ministries, portfolio, offices, boards, over 300. Because we still, at the end of the day, have to have a governance structure to ensure that corruption never creeps into our country. We need to ensure that there are checks and balances. And you could be here last week when we had um, the minister from Montserrat visiting. Population of 5,000 people since the volcano. But you know what hasn't changed? Still the same governance structure of checks and balances to make sure that you still have a community that of law-abiding people and so forth. Because like I said, guys, I don't say this much. Our job as a government is not to create equal outcome. Our job is to create equal opportunities, give everybody a fair chance. And through your work, I think in dedication and commitment, you can do better. That other system is socialism, that other system is communism. We're not about that. That's not what they like us to do. It's about giving everybody equal opportunity. And just as I said um, to you guys, you're going to start as business people also. If people who should be buying your services are smuggling people, some of them even come in on visitors' work permit to do jobs that you can provide. How does that help you? And yet you're all part of the same association. I can tell you, so I have business people come to me and talk to me sometimes, and I'm looking at them and kind of like, you understand where I sit, I know your business and I know what you're doing. And I just have to sit with them and smile. Do we have people inside this room right now that have been fine by my department? And you would never know who because I'll smile in the same way. So this is the business that we're in. So like I said, it's not going to be perfect, but we have to start somewhere. And the vast majority of employers are still good, decent people who's trying to give everybody opportunities, but we can't be treating them like they're criminals. We can't be treating them like they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
Will um sorry. Oh, this will mean this very very right. quick one. Will employers have visibility to what level of accreditation they have when this new system is rolled mm -hmm. out? It has a what means of incentivization on red rated and rather yeah, than the, the team backs down for transparency. Absolutely. Okay. If we shall head on. When the whole work was put together years ago, one of the things we envisioned was we spend millions sending students on scholarships every year, and we have our kids coming back qualified with qualifications. Is there like a database or something that companies can know that these individuals are coming back? And are you all looking at them? So who's coming back compared to the jobs that we have? So very good observation, um, and it's actually something that we we continue to work on uh, right now. One of the things going back to a previous question was, um, what are we actually doing in relation to looking at the labor market research? Um, you know, looking at skills, looking at gaps, looking at where the labor trends are, um, and one of the things that we recognized that was totally off school was in fact. Um, looking at tertiary um, education, scholarship awardees. Uh, so the team has been uh, engaging with uh, Ministry of Education as well uh, in relation to how can we actually assist um, from the onset of um, even scholarship awardees. Where are they in the process of education? Um, what industries are they coming back to? And not necessarily uh, where they want assistance, um, being able to actually assist them and connect them to the industry uh, leaders. Um, and that's what we're currently working on at this stage. So uh, you would be correct that that was a gap. Well, that was the only question I came here to ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, Michelle that asked that question is actually a perfect position because what we realized that one of our civil servants sitting in a back room can't make the level of introductions necessary to get put in the door for particular on the white collar businesses. Where they are with the relationships that they have with their employers, we have to channel them in order to ensure that that's where the introductions are made. Because if you're sending resumes on top of resumes, the odds are stacked against you that you won't even get past the first step. Um, so, so the recruitment agencies um, have an important role to play as we go forward as well. We, we recognize that with some of the work we've done with a couple of recruitment agencies last year and the year before. But, and the follow-up question that I had, so this is coming out of um, a discussion that I've had with some youngsters who are unable to get jobs, graduated, graduated up from university and so on. And, they, and so the people that always, that tend to always commit the breaches, are we going to make examples of them? And, and just say that, I listen to the DP. No, no, I'm not bringing the door. Yeah. I listen to the DP. Just start talking about the type of leadership that we're going to get if we don't fly right. They are there. They're there. And I'm, I meet with them all the time. You know, we have a good relationship. But it's no good to be hey, mankind, hey, man nice, if we're not going to enforce a system where, we, where it's clear to those where there's a breach that there's a responsibility that follows that as well. So yeah. I, actually, I'll, I'll come in on that one. Um, and I want to speak the words very carefully. And the reason why I'm choosing my words carefully is the fact that, as I said before, as far as we are concerned as a government, we have appointed competent boards that are backed up by law in terms of their responsibilities, their roles, and everything else. And one of the things that we don't ever, ever want to be accused of is any form of political interference. What I can see, and is only because someone said something in my presence, is that there are going to be some decisions that will be coming down. I, I suspect it's going to be coming down, that it is not going to be popular, but it's going to send a very strong message that we mean business. And the only thing I say to my um, boards, and I will say to them is, do your job. We've got four floor lawyers. Lawyers don't frighten us. We've got retainers to be the lawyers. Do your job. That's all I will say. So some people are afraid sometimes to pull the trigger because they are afraid of the, having the political support um, behind it. All I said to them is, do your job. And if you need to get that turn in general, whoever it is to get one of the defending decision, I will do it. 
Because I can tell you one of the first things when I came in, I when they brought something to me about that we need to do this, the first thing I said to them is, I got two words for you, Privy Council. That's Chris on the day in the winner. It's gonna come out here from the Privy Council before I do that. So even if it be in this court, that court, I am prepared to go to the Privy Council and make no bones about it. There are very few employers on this island that can more money than the Cayman Islands government. And I can tell you right now, and I have this advantage of being the Minister of Finance, but we're not afraid to find the resources to put to defend any decision that my board made. But I can tell you, it is coming. And I have, like I said, I have full faith now, and I will, I'll leave it at that. So, T, I can tell you, it coming. And love again. Thank you. Jane, I think you had a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on unemployment, uh, the rates, thanks for the direct correlation with crimes, it's happened over and over again. Previous times we've had high crime, uh, I took it upon myself and didn't need to work, uh, different department names at the time, and trying to get information that we could share with the association that was on the chamber at the time, and trying to spread that across to the associations. But I got stuck where we weren't given the information of your clients that were seeking work or given the right amount of information. You know, all we're looking at is for resumes of who was who was needing work, and then we can distribute it at contract association and bank association, whatever association fit that. We can fix that problem of unemployment. It's, it's establishing those that don't want to work, as you know, and those that legitimately want to work, and through the chamber and, and, the, and the council of associations, let us put those on our agendas for our, our meetings and fix the problem. So we need to open up that that line of communication because uh, there's a lot of work that goes in on, on your end to try and find work for those folks. A lot of work on our end trying to go through the advertising process, interview process, but we can circumvent it and shorten that gap by getting the information in our hands and making our boards accountable and then and all the companies that are sitting on those boards. You're welcome back. We we tried it before, but we didn't. I had multiple meetings with the department and we did it. It was all everyone, you know, it was a great conversation, but we never received anything to put into action. So we do have a, a data protection issue to work through, and I think it will mean some changes on our end. Because as the DP talked about earlier, our pool is made up of people who are underemployed as well. So they're looking for opportunities to better use their existing skills. Mm -hmm. But they don't necessarily, because we are small, they don't necessarily want their current employers to know that they're shopping around. So mm -hmm. we would have to get their permission to share to share their information. Yeah. We also realize that through the NAU process, which is being completely overhauled now, persons on long-term NAU are forced to register for jobs and get sent out. And they're either not equipped or not interested. They're still counted as, as persons seeking employment because it's a requirement of the NAU process. Mm -hmm. But as you employers to know, and you, many of you have made representations to me that you keep your own list of people that you've turned away over the years, or you've given opportunities who worked for 40 years and didn't come back, or, or purposefully failed it into because they didn't want the job to begin with. Mm -hmm. We know that that's happening, and we're actually working with that ministry and that, that agency to ensure that we aren't sending people that aren't fit for purpose. Um, and I think that was just help. Those that are legitimate looking for and and want to have uh, upward upward opportunities, but we have to we have to put some some structures in place to ensure that we can legally share the information with you. Yeah, and yeah. there are some operational questions here, Jeremy. I guess it could direct to you. This is about the security guard in sector that area. Re regarding recent changes to require a work permit before the issue of a security guard license. Was consideration given to the fact that it takes quite some time, weeks, often months, to receive a security guard license from the RCIPS, um, and having the work permit prior to having getting the work permit is problematic. Um, the security guard license first ensures that doing the license first ensures that checks are done via Interpol, etc and applicants are properly cleared. Otherwise, where a security guard license is not issued, it opens up work to more administrative work in terms of cancellations and refunds when the security guard license is turned down later on. So on that note, this department, um, this department of the RCFPS does need additional staffing. It's, it's a comment. Okay. So I, I was familiar with um, some challenges that was actually 
uh, being raised uh, mainly by firearm and security, um, RCFDS, in particular in relation to security guards, uh, one of the measures that we uh, quickly address internally was actually being able to approve those work permits subject to the actual um, uh, verification or issuance of the security licenses. What was happening before is that we would require the licenses um, prior to um, approval. So I'm not sure if, again, it was a, a little skewed in relation to the question, um, but that was something that we internally implemented within the last month. Um, I haven't heard that uh, it's spiked up any further concerns, um, but I think that was a quick win in relation to um, addressing those concerns. And again, I'm asking these questions. Please don't hold them against me. <laughs> <laughs> So next one is, good afternoon all. Lately, we have been experiencing delays in having advertisements approved via the jobs came in. It typically takes one to three days to receive an approval once submitted. However, we are noticing that it is taking at least five to six days for the advertisement to be approved, which then pushes back the initial end date. How can we go about having the initial end date honored? So... It's a tongue twister, sorry. Yeah, no, no, I, I understood at one at uh, the initial stage that the expectations was three to five days uh, for the clearances. Uh, we may have um, actually been processing and approving them a little quicker than uh, what was expected initially. Um, but I do know that the KPIs around advertisement approvals was three to five days. Um, but in relation to the any delays in the advertisements being approved, um, in consideration of when it was submitted. Uh, we can actually take a look at that. But I do believe um, there may be some implications as to, uh, from a technological standpoint, um, and the way that that's built. But I'm willing to, to take that on board and look at that. Another one, are there plans to proceed with allowing partial refunds for annual PR fees where status has been granted within a few weeks or months or making the annual payment? That's a business of finance. That's good. This is more of a control than business of finance. I'm going to speed back on that one. <laughs> yeah, but one thing that I want to go back to, um, we'll just to touch on the previous. We do see some of these tailor made ads that are coming out. I'm going to ask people sometimes, but they're not stopping. Ask them some of these ridiculous requirements sometimes. It, it really does clogs out the system. And, and this is where we really want to get an accreditation program. We, we see some master degree being asked for in this one. And I mean, it, 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 some of these are just really, really ridiculous. And I'm really sorry that Teresa has left. Because when you look at some of this stuff that end up before you the labor, labor um, appeals drive you on the different labor boards and so forth. I mean, it, it's really untrue that some of these employees, like, now one of the things, um, that, that, that was an issue, and I think Premier touched on it yesterday, is about sexual harassment and all that kind of stuff too. I mean, we already have the gender equality, we have the sexual harassment. Again, these are some of the stuff that is common, that is becoming common within the workplace. And I'm going to ask, well, Charles, they're common, but we're going to ask employers to make sure you have the proper processes and procedures in place to deal with these kind of issues internally and the same as the escalation, escalation problem. And because some of these... I mean, again, we live in a small community. And when some employers, you know, say some things or write some things or WhatsApp some employees, some stuff, and then they screenshot it and send it to us as the MPs, it has me see that man in church and, and look at it the same way too. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the, the big organizations generally have these things. But I'm just asking people, you know, sometimes you want somebody that is a specific person you want and you recognize that that person's key to your business. And you will do whatever you have to do to get a person. But one of the things that we are looking at is even exempting, like farmers, for example, that has become a, a big issue. And in and, and, and different positions that we're looking at to say, you know what, these ones we can't take the advertisement that we realize some of these are personal to people. They chef, I mean, these are, you know, we have a good amount already, sorry, that's already exempt as is. And we're looking to see who else we can add to the exempt list. Because, I mean, I think it was just a couple of days back. At one business, at literally one key employee, didn't get the um, PR, didn't get the points, 
but this person is so essential to the person's business. No, I haven't, speak, I haven't spoken to that elderly arm person who requires a person for their life. Effort. I now have to say, you know, I have to go take a cabinet exemption note to cabinet to ask for that person to be exempt from the um, door work permit process so that at least they can continue to help this game money and family who relies on that person for their small business. But one of the things, um, I just want to put it out there yet because it's not something I've discussed with caucus, but I've discussed it with my chief officer in terms of looking for a class of work permits or a category of work permits that will not accrue any benefits, but will just allow people to continue to work. Because we do recognize that some people will never get the 110 points needed to PR. But these are good people. And when you force those people to leave, would have been there for seven, eight, nine years, commit no crime, and then you're bringing in someone to replace them. You don't even know who you're bringing in sometime in this day and age. You know, so if you have someone who's already a proven product that you know they can't um, apply or get it, let us see if we can find a way for them to continue to work. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about um, employees, we fail to realize that there are thousands of people that are even employed at a domestic level in, in the Cayman and people home store. They are also considered employees. I mean, no. You talk about two, three thousand homes very easily with a domestic level. I can say here as a politician, that two, three thousand also have votes. You really don't really think that I can do something, you not know, bear in mind your needs also. So it's about sitting down now and trying to find, you know, let us see if we can exempt that. You know, we, we see where the caregivers, they have built up that um, emotional attachment to two people. And then to say to somebody that, oh, you're going to lose your helper who cooks your breakfast and exactly what salt you need, not sugar. And then they're going to go home. For what? I mean, so like I said, you know, we, we need to find that balance. But again, you know, we still have to factor in human rights and all this other stuff that goes with it. But we're looking for something like that that will make it much easier to say, we know there are no key manuals interested in this line of work. Let us see what it is that we can do. I mean, for right now, and then we, we can move, we can adjust as we need to go. Last year, the uh, Chamber Council met with the Cayman Islands Bankers Association and, and had probably what I felt was one of our best meetings where they discussed getting away from paying checks and trying to go everything electronic. Um, as a result, I went back to, to the business and I, I, I looked at all the checks we were writing and uh, Mr. Clifford, we are still writing an enormous amount of checks. And I went online and I took a look at how payments are made. I'm wondering if you can speak to any initiatives as to what may be coming in the future in terms of trying to get away from you know, paper money and not. So good afternoon, everyone. This is my first time to speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> good news on that. I mean, we, we started a, a, a program to enhance our, our IT platform some years ago, and as all of you would appreciate that, when you enhance an IT platform, it, it doesn't end there, right? It's a, it's a work in progress and you continue to make improvements. So the next phase of that includes online payments. That's coming very shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be not later than the second quarter of this year. We begin to roll that out. And we've been working with our ministry on that. And so there's good news on the horizon for that. Um, and you can see that change happening very soon. I believe I can share what, what our pain point is, our, our current bank, when the EFT is coming through, a large ministry like ours that covers, added all together, $350 million worth of revenue a year, thereabouts. They truncated the memo line, so we couldn't tell where the funding was coming from. And to be able to match that up for imports, for work permits, is an impossible task, so we end up with money that we don't know what it's for. Um, so we had to close off that loop because it just created more problems instead of making it easier, made it worse. We've changed by coming up um, and also working on the online systems which tie the payment in. Because what, what we don't want is to have large customers paying by credit card. That's not efficient for them, not efficient for us. So we do recognize that EFTs is the way to go with that, but we need all of that tied together to make it happen. One thing I want to leave with you guys too. Combined in this ministry, talking about 350 million. If you all believe that the Ministry of Finance is going to uh, support paying two, three percent commission yeah. on that kind of money. So I can tell you online transfers, yes. But the minute you start getting into because I can tell you I've seen people to get points in the credit card, start paying this on stuff up there. We recognize that. But I can tell you I can't go back and give up four, five, six million dollars. 
and bank commission fees when that can be used for other social programs. So that's the bear in mind. <laughs> so there's several questions online. I'll just go through a couple. One's the construction industry. They said it would be it it would help if there is a method that we are where we could hire Caymanians temporarily as the work work ramps up. There are projects where uh, we would not require full-time employees. So what happens is we go to the labor brokers who would typically have work permit holders. So I don't know, just a general question. I'm not sure it's a yeah. question or a comment. So another great observation. Um, I guess a quick response for me is definitely we have um, a list of uh, job seekers uh, who being Caymanian would be willing to, to take on part-time jobs. Uh, we really should be the, the first place of uh, where individuals act or employer shop uh, for those individuals. If in fact we don't have anyone to act or match, then obviously, yes, we do know that the, the historical approach would actually be going to labor brokers uh, and looking at subcontracting, et cetera. But again, um, we would promote highly that obviously we'd be the first place for that employers are at to shopping for part time um, employees. employees. Our, our team at programs on the construction industry show that those individuals that successfully complete are employed. Um, one of the discussions we had with the Minister of Labor in Jamaica when we were there last year was that Jamaica, who's known as an exporter of labor, was actually importing construction labor to Jamaica because they don't have plumbers, they don't have tilers because countries like Cayman are pulling um, the best of their best. So they're actually importing um, to Bachville at this point. So we recognize that. And I think Dave spoke about the vaccination issue com com compounding that issue in yeah. relation to sourcing labor. But it's it's a not, there's a shortage. It's compounding the issue? Vaccination, yeah, of a labor shortage, absolutely. And sorry, Minister Brian, I'm going to put you on the spot here. When Mr. Brian came to call us, we do when I moved the back to requirements. I was just sitting there and I said, Listen, this is the same man who was out here raising all of this money to drive his back. <laughs> 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 but you see, the, the point I wanted to make though, at that time, yes. if we did not get the vaccination rate, we could not be kind of it. You know what I mean? And it, it goes to show you, you put things in a context in which it is no all of a sudden now. Now, yes, it needs a story to know what's up. <laughs> I mean, is it revenue for January? I'm going to tell you right now. It's the tourism accommodation revenue for the month of January. It's twice what it was in January 2019. All right. And wow. at least about almost 40% above what it was in, in January 2020, which in essence was, that was still pre-COVID to some extent. Yeah. So I mean, it's like over 5.5 million. Back in 2019, it was like 2.6 million. And in 2020, January, it was like about 4 million. So... I mean, 2021 or crap, but the man working and the, the thing about it is, as I said to um, our ministers, is that my fear, while well, it's a good fear, is that he will bring the people in and then we have the housing issue. Because when we do look at it, when we did the census, we had a population of 71, there was 105 in the census. No, the last labor force survey, we have a population of past 80,000. No, that's 10,000 people up right here. We have not constructed that much residences. And then what has compounded the issue is that homes or apartments that were once in the domestic rental pool has now moved to the Airbnb market. So now it has cut back on the domestic um, availability of um, room and demand is going up, supply is going down, waiting out the price. And I was in a certified percent of the CPI. Mm -hmm. And then of course, that is also compounded again by the fact that the Fed keep raising interest rates and we have a significant amount of loans in Cayman that is actually, I think the last time I looked at the CMA stats, it was like 3 billion US dollars worth of loans. And a large amount of that is still actually on, it's actually, I think not even just domestic loans actually, um, 3 billion, and a lot of that is actually a variable rate. Now, for us, the ultimate goal is actually to create a capital market. And Maria, the bank will tell you, they're lending out money for 25, 30 years, there's nobody giving them a deposit for 25, 30 years. That creates a liquidity the risk that itself comes at a cost, that comes at a price. So we can actually get long-term money and support back um, long-term investment, long-term. We've seen some cases in the US where the Fed rate is going up and even mortgage rates are going down simply because their mortgages are tied to the bond market. You know what I mean? But we all see what is happening that the Fed is also, quote unquote, 
um, destroy the man. That is what it is that they've been driving. Now, it seems that they even get ready to throw the towel because now they're coming up with this new definition now of um, was it a super core CPI or something like that, where they're taking out certain elements out of it because they can't ar um, arrest inflation. And Jerome Powell has made it clear that he was not stop raising interest rate until real interest rate will come back positive. So if you guys want to go to a quick glass and look at real interest rate, it was like negative 1.19. It means that inflation is still above the interest rate. And while some people may not see it as business as usual, you have a 7% interest rate for over um, a 10 year period, that's 50% of the buying power you'd have lost. And then for people who are pensioners, and, if, and we do have to recognize the fact that we have an aging population. I mean, you can't have, have people literally have their buying power diminished by 50% in a 10 year period. Going up. So these are all the bigger issues that we also have to look at and to try to what it is that we can find our way to get around it. Now, you look inside the, um, the banks, the majority of the money inside the banks are still the US dollar. US dollar interest rate is US dollar interest rate. And if anyone believes that someone over there is paying four or 5% on US dollars and you pay near 1% and that money ain't gonna go there, it's a whole different story. And on top of that, when I actually look at even again, look at the last SEMA stats, the total amount of domestic deposits we had was $3.6 billion, $3 billion lent. Bankers will tell you, you have something in reference to a sticky deposit. You're now reasonable about maybe 20 or 30% of the deposits. So when you even sit down and even analyze our own domestic market, the truth of the fact is, there's a lot of foreign deposits that actually drive our loan book here in Cayman too. So we've got to be very careful in terms of the environment we set and we make sure that we keep welcoming money people, we can bring their monies and all that inside here too. So is an overall part of what we need to look at now in terms of rebalancing the economy. Our fundamentals are still sound, but for us, it's still about how we can find ways to improve the quality of our people's life, giving them opportunity, make sure the buying power is there. As I said, Minister Jay is working tirelessly to get that food security to the network once so we can bring down food. But in fairness, from speaking to supermarkets, and there was something that um, I had one conversation with, with one um, owner, I didn't even think of. He says, you know, Chris, I can probably bring in cheaper brands. But here's a problem. I can't get that quantity guaranteed. I can't guarantee. And the last thing I want is my supermarket shelves to be empty. So, you know, yes, you may have a brand that may cost a little bit more, but the quantity is guaranteed. You can then get a cheaper brand. You get one shipment, you know, see that again for the next two, three months. You know, so we have also developed our own brand loyalty and all that kind of stuff too. So, even the supermarkets right now, they themselves are trying to go out there you know, to rebalance the very brands that they use. You know what I mean? And you, you can see the go some days, these nice little juices, they cost 79 cents, and the one right beside is $3. Different, same brand, and this one, the, the, the supply just isn't there. So there are other stuff, and you know, bear in mind, 8,000 people, it's a small town in the US. You know, you like to think that, you know, yeah, we can't the scale, we don't in some situations. You know, so these are the kind of stuff where social planners are a wicked problem. You think it's all in one problem, you create another problem. And guys, I can tell you, I have studied Caribbean history. I have studied Caribbean politics and I've studied politics as something I went to school for. I try my best to learn from the mistakes of countries that have failed. And I can tell you, it is those countries that is the government start getting themselves into a lot of things they're not supposed to get themselves into. And one thing I give, I mean, I'm going to just close off on this one. I look at the United States when they were building their country. Bear in mind, no country around them had what they were looking to do. Every country was ruled really by kings and queens. They didn't even know how to get a structure. They actually found their structure in the Bible. Isaiah 33, 22. For God is a lawgiver, judge and king, he shall save us. Lawgiver, legislative, judge, judicial, king, executive. That's why they came up with the three branches. And they did recognize when they were building their country that the legislative branch would have had too much power over the executive and over the judicial. So what did they do? They cut the legislative branch in two. The House of Representatives and the Senate. One go every election every two years, and one was election six years. And the reason why that was done was to put a brick on popular power. 
was to put a break on populism. We have seen the damages of populism right now around the globe. People went and did not globalization like crazy. We're now living a post-globalization world. Look at the price of oil. The cooperation that people, we can't build a society on competition. We must build on some level of cooperation on some level of understanding. And then the crazies get up with these nice little sound bites that get up and say, do this, do that, whatever, without seeing the bigger picture. So when the House of Representatives goes and the crazies may come in, at least one third of the Senate stays there at a the time, or well, two thirds of the Senate stays, and another one third of the Senate goes to the poll each time. And the Senate is there designed to block that popular power. We don't have no safeguards in our system where you can just get up one day and have a crazy slate of people who just ticked off and go elect some crazy people up in this country. And I can tell you, as quick as we have this, it won't take nothing but confidence to leave. And this is what it is that we have built. I mean, Caymanians have done very well and people who have came here and made the Caymanians that won't have done very well in what we have. And our purpose of coming here today is not to say that we have the answer for everything, but to say, you know what? We can't sit down and plan what we want to do without the feedback. You know what I mean? And that's pretty much what it is. And I brought my team here, and one of the things I want to um, emphasize is access to them. In the sense of, you know, we need to find a way in which we can get emails answered quicker. We need to get phone call answered quicker and so forth. I have a problem sometimes finding some of you guys. And then they build stuff, but they at least they call back. You know what I mean? But but they'll call back to them at night too. But I didn't least still only 24 hours in a day. What's you know the what timeline mean? for your budget submission? No, but well, the budget has to be approved before the seven thirty first is here. But the um the SPS has to be done, which will guide the budget by the first of May. And I mean mm -hmm. we have a ministerial street. So, like I said, the last SPS was done in a COVID environment. We were locked down, we we're coming out of it. You know what I mean? And again, coming out of the general election, I mean, within three months of the general election, your prior is pretty much your manifesto. Right. So pretty much what it is we campaign on is about global cross SPS. Now we're still back now realizing that the environment has changed. I can't come back now and have a, um, a recovery type SPS to some extent when that is what the government was dealing with at that time. Now we have opened up, we have seen what it look like. Last year was the first time in the history of the Cayman Islands that the central government has actually passed a billion dollar mark in terms of revenues. So you show that the confidence is still in the Cayman Islands and the place to do business. You know what I mean? And we need to make sure we, we continue with that. We need to build on that. And at the same time, recognizing that there are challenges. Inflation is still a problem for us. Ozone is still a um, problem for us. And the last thing that we want is the government not to go and rack up massive amounts of debt, building something, when we can find a way, or we need to find a way to incentivize the private sector to actually do it. So one of the things that we're looking at, we went through the process of guaranteed mortgages or guaranteeing loan mortgages. That's to last 25, 30 years. Why don't we look at start guaranteeing and, um, the loans, the business that want to build those homes. Those can be done in two year period, turn out quickly, and it's a shorter liability time period. So it makes no use to guarantee your home, but you can't guarantee anybody building it. You know, so these are again the kind of stuff that we're playing for the progress put together the O's and task force and the staff will do some really, really good work in that regard. And we're hoping that if by the time we present the SPS, we can actually speak about the plans in terms of what we can have to incentivize people in terms of actually getting that. But again, these are long-term decisions that require to some extent long-term solutions. And then you had a question. Yes, actually, uh, there's an article that was written Jan 25th by Joanna Boxall concerning investing in gold, precious metals in the Cayman Islands, where it, it specifies that it's a good market and, and, and they talk about it's kind of being duty free. But I, I've been told or I've heard through the grapevine that there's been attacks imposed on, on gold and precious metals recently. Is that correct? 4% duty has been imposed, yes. Um, and there are two things I want to argue because I've had this argument with many people. They come to me first and they say, Chris, gold is money. Well, first of all, gold is not money, gold is a commodity. But let me give you two, two answers to that. One, gold itself is a stored value, a commodity. Some people invest in real estate, they pay 7.5% duty. Some people invest in watches, they pay 7% duty. Some people invest in diamonds, they pay 12% duty. All of a sudden, gold is now exempt 
And then we also live in a world where you can't have people coming into your country, stockpiling that old pile of God you knows or what. I mean, I don't want to use anybody money loan or anything like that, but you can't have something like that coming in and in a day and age of where you, you just can't have people out there walking around. Well, that's basically unexplained. But then if they say to me that um, gold is money, I said, okay, that means yeah, I got to accept the term of gold is money. It means that you're accepting a deposit. If you're accepting a deposit, you need to be registered by CBA. We'll get registered by CBA, pay a million dollar fee, like well, all these other banks being for the class A license to take in deposits, and then we can go do what we do. But you understand something. SEMA regulates primarily when you take something from the public. If you wake up tomorrow and decide that you want to be nice and lend your money out at 2% because you feel good, you don't need a SEMA license for that. It's your money. You can do what you want. But the minute you're taking something from the public of value, we have a right to know what it is that you're doing in order to also protect the public too. And at the same time, and I'm going to say this to people, when we talk about 9-11, which some people have forgotten about, which I have not, because I went to school in New York. What do you think would have ever happened to the Cayman Islands if one terrorist had got one dollar from some bank account or some entity in the Cayman Islands when the US wanted blood? Our financial service industry that drives more than 60% of our GDP would have been, I wouldn't even want to think what would have happened to it. But the point about it is this, it is still an, um, a year of stored value. Everybody else pay some kind of duty on stored value. And I don't see why anybody should be exempt. And if you don't want to pay the duty on something of stored value, we'll get registered by SEMA, get your bank license, pay your fees and be regulated. In the month of September, October, I think it was last year, $30 billion of gold were purchased um, globally. Nobody knew who bought it. Everybody suspected the Chinese. Nobody knows. You know what I mean? So we're not living in a day and age right now where something has gold, just like oh, you have your money inside your bank and you know, KYC and everything is being done on it. Someone wants to sit down. I remember one guy come to me when he was telling me what gold bro, I put that I think you want to hear that control all the leak. There are people out there who know that you got on your house will come visit you. I didn't want to hear it. But I have myself a shock. And I remember asking, where the hell you got all the money from? But I didn't want to say nothing either. You know what I mean? But again, this is the world that we're living in right now. And it is an era of risk. And we have seen where Kim has on the gray list. And the last thing we want is having another um, commodity or another reason. You know what I mean? We saw the Venezuelan, uh, was it the Venezuelan? A smuggler gold in the front of the plane or whatever. I mean, these are realities of what it is that we're looking at. And even though gold is due to free the Cayman Islands, they're still trying to smuggle it. What does that tell you? You know, so. <laughs> Going back to processing time you've been speaking at length about work permits, but as it relates to PR holders, there seems to be a backlog in that as well in terms of the processing time. So are there steps to reduce that time that we time and also as we spoke about the proven product for the amendment of those who have already received um PR as well? There's great length of time waiting to amend their title as well. So is there any plans or measures to reduce that? Well, I'm not saying this much. I don't think the issue with the PR times now is too long. I honestly believe the previous PR process was actually too short. I mean, you are given someone a pathway to live in your country forever and a day. They need to be scrutinized. They need to be properly vetted. Everybody make people. And I can tell you, if I had any doubts, Recent events I saw in one of our Caribbean neighbors where he actually had a convicted child molester who went through all the process of disguising himself, went in their country and set up a charity that was operating for like four or five years with children. With children. You know what I mean? And of course, I mean, they end up causing the director of their job, but and all that does for me is reinforce that I expect the scrutiny to be there. We're not talking about people are coming on island. These are people already here. We're not stopping people from working, they're already here. We're, they're not taking anything from them. We just need to make sure we know who it is that we're bringing, and more importantly, who is working around our children and our families. And that's as simple as that. And then once they're vetted and they have their PR, 
then when they want to amend their title to for a promotion or on a new avenue of employment, then that same length of process in time. No, no, they wouldn't even need that because they would have first you you, you, you better to stay here. But then there's also like there are other factors to consider because in some cases, and I, and I know um uh, one recently where there were people when they were looking to change it, there were people who had actually applied for that job. And people need to understand something, you know, your PR is personal to order. Yeah. It is not something, and for a lot of reasons, we know employers pay the PR fees and all that kind of stuff. But a PR holder, right. it is not part of the employment process. That is something personal to you. Yeah. And if we sit down and we grant your PR based on the fact that there was a shortage of what skills you have at this time, and then all of a sudden, now you want to move to another area where there is no shortage, it's not going to be that easy. You got it on this basis. So the only person uh, or person on the island that can move unfettered through the entire arm system are Kim Islands. And, 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 and people, you know, so people need to understand that. And I can tell you, I know friends who have been waiting on US, UK citizens and one that it takes them years. And we're the only country people expect to fast track this as a door, it's like at a drive through window. So I can tell you, it's not this process is too long. The previous process was just too short. Problem. Yeah, no, I uh, can love you. I don't like the cash too. So if there are any um, questions or, and guys, listen, even though this may be for the SPS process, I have no problem trying to come back here even once a quarter or something and having these conversations because at the end of the day, we need the feedback, we need the dialogue, and as I said before, you know, we want the community to drive the process, we want the private sector to drive the process, we want the people to drive the process. So this is not one and done, but hopefully you know the start and whenever you guys invite me, I'll always make my from best to I'm sure. The economic forum. Yeah. <laughs> Just one quick question. On jobs Taylor, how many employees are actually registered on there? How many Canadians are looking at that jobs Taylor? I don't get that. So currently, there's a close to two thousand uh, plus that are actually registered. What what is a bit difficult at times because you have a variety of job seekers, um, whether or not they are registered to shop or look around. Um, maybe they are underemployed um, as well as they are unemployed. Um, and at times, you have persons that may change, in fact, their status of employment. But don't necessarily have Is that, that a quick job there, where them. I haven't got anybody for work permit or anything else and had no responses. Mm -hmm. So I was always curious in terms of how many people that are actually yeah, yeah. registered on. We made a change last year as well to, to remove the um, registration process before you can see the jobs. Mm -hmm. So you won't actually necessarily have to be registered right. after not as well. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. you registered, you want to apply, but anybody could look and see what's you there. So okay. that's opened the window as well. But it does demonstrate that we do have a labor shortage. Our chief HR manager is behind it. Reminded me to, to say CBC and work are both suffering from a shortage of HR staff. Uh, Michelle is gone, but there may be some other HR people in the room knowing that good talent is hard to find. So she's begging me to say if you have people that are good that you can spare, uh, we're looking to recruit as well because we are only as good as our, our, our internal people and, and we want to do the best to build them up. Continue to Just a follow up on that. When they register on the portal, do they have to select whether they're employed, unemployed, or unemployed so that you get a sense of what's the makeup? They, they do. So, um, one thing I didn't get to um, explain is that actually, as of September, we were able to actually put together one of our first detailed labor research market um, uh, reports. And uh, for, for others, we can actually definitely share it with the chamber. It's, it's excellent. Yeah. yeah we have. Um, so it does give us quite a bit of details in relation to uh, job seekers, uh, much less the, the uh, labor market as it relates to jobs, industries, et cetera, uh, salaries, uh, qualifications. So it does put us in a really good position to be able to, to know exactly what is happening out there and then how to bridge some of these gaps. And I, and I can say that even if you have questions beyond the hour of interruption at three o'clock, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the parliamentary has got that long. <laughs> Work has regular interfaces with the chamber, um, with the board of directors, so you can feed your comments through them, your pain points, because they do keep us on this year round. Um, and if we don't meet, then I hear about it. So uh, <laughs> if I don't hear about it, people will hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> then those changes will be looking at open regular as well. Thank you.
Just a quick question, wanting to understand more about whether there's an established set of criteria that's assessed in the decision and that's whether or not to attach a regulation six to a position. So regulation six, uh, typically done by this is our um, and they look at the business plan, they look at the labor supply, um, and they they then weigh whether or not there is enough labor in there that folks can advance. Um, and there's some industries that get it more than others. There's some industries that, and the deputy premier has a meeting with some industry um, specific folks last year, where those in industries have demonstrated by experience that they are ones that came out and progressed a significant number as percentage wise um, of those employed and are, are holding you know top positions across the board. Um, the opposite of that are other industries where their pool that came out is available, like they don't seem to be advancing. And that's where the business staffing plan comes in and looks at, you know, this just doesn't seem to have the same level of upward progression. So again, looking out for the voters, looking out for people who got came out home um, and have no other home, we want to ensure that the right sixes are applied in the cases where they're there. Now, if right sixes are applied and you don't legitimately have hopes, there's a there's a mechanism for that. Um, and there's always the, the appeals route as well. But the the, the, right, the right six is really um, for protection of and uh, to, to ensure that they offer that last One of the things I want to add on that, sorry, being a former member of the Business Savant Plan Board, is that we do recognize that when businesses, first of all, to be on the Business Savant Plan Board, you have to have a, something like a Business Savant Plan. I think once you have about 15 and above, mm -hmm. you have to have a Business Savant Plan. Most businesses, do not go through the process sometimes of updating their business staffing plan to say, well, you know, and we do recognize that these things cannot be business because you move at the speed of business. You can do a plan today, things may change um, next year. So sometimes it's very easier to just update the business staffing plan that will set it easier for the committee members as they're going through and reviewing updated business staffing plan. They say, well, this is what we can expect. But if you have an old business staffing plan in place, and then you're trying to something, you were like, wait a minute. It's almost as if your business um, staff and plan become obsolete to some extent. It put more work, it put more pressure, and it put more subjectivity to the board members. So I would say to business people, like, you know, be proactive, take the time out of dating business staff and plan sometimes before you even apply, especially when you're going to need a ton of work permits, because it will, it will just reduce the scrutiny, because the scrutiny will be done at the business staff and plan amendment level. Yes. Um, go ahead. I've, I've spoken several times. <laughs> As it relates to business plan, from what I have experienced for the last almost um, many years in our company, that it takes a long time. The last time we submitted a business plan was 2019. It was not approved after many much following up with Aaron until 2021. Two years. When, when, when 2021? Like I said, no, in order to be the BSP, um, um, speaking to the chairperson, they do have a subcommittee that focuses entirely um, on looking at business staff and plan, and then they'll take that to the wider board. So I know outside of the actual meeting, they do meet just separately just to look at um, business staff and plan. So that's one of the things that they have been doing. What I can say, and this is one discussion that we are we are looking at now, is we may probably have been, may pass in the point where some of these um, committees that are voluntary in nature to some extent and receive a small stipend, some of them may have to be moved to a more full time basis, and that is one of the things that we're looking at because you know when the law was created versus the amount of business we have now and the amount of productivity we have now. Our processes are not get based on productivity. Okay. And, but at the same time, I'm still mindful of the fact that, as I said earlier, in the last five years, increased expenses by 201 million, but I want to increase revenues by 183 million. So that's a gap or a, a trend that we cannot continue on, also. Just the reason why the focus is on automation, just the reason why the focus on accreditation. So once you're accredited and so forth, we're just open to literally get AI to just literally spit it out. So if you're green, the administrators can deal with it. If you're AMBO, we expect it to go like, to the director level. And if you're red, it went to the board. Okay. And so we're, we're trying to, to get to that process in place. Okay. That's what the um, success looks like for us once we get this um, pretty much done. But get as much of it automated, reduce the amount of papers and everything, and it will come much easier. 
So, like I said, we will look at five, six thousand decisions, but then people have found this leave on that. Whereas once you go automated, you can't upload until everything is there. And that will also then reduce the amount of processing time. Because the flip side is, we can as our administrator say, no, this is missing, let us reject the permit and turn it down. But that is not a business friendly environment. And many of them actually go above and beyond to call the people up. You need to send this, you need to send that, you need to do this, you need to do that. Trust me, they still have families and they still need to get home to. And we need to ensure that they have their quality of life also. But I can't stop it there at this 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night and on weekends doing this bigger farm mistake. Thank you. No problem. Jeremy, this one for you. Okay, so the work permit amendment for promotion, we had a, a, an application there from August 2022, and it's still there. Followed up Carol blessing. And she now moved it to March for the March. So that's seven So I think it's it's quite clear that we have we have delays. Um with that, um, I'm assuming this is connected to the business admin. It is right. Uh, right. So we if 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 you have gotten some sort of traction on it um in relation to process and time, we'll definitely keep a check on that. Uh, but there are restrictions as to what applications can be viewed by administrators yeah. that I kind of shared uh, yeah. earlier on. The difference in process and times for administrators versus the boards and their capacities to, to actually meet and process applications as quickly as administrators as well. Um, but we will we'll continue to do what is um, more efficient, uh, but still ensuring the governance is actually back to system. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wes, I'd like to get back to Regulation 6. Um, what can an organization do if they're, if they're providing a terms uh, business staffing plan and they're getting a Regulation 6 on an employee? Is there any way to address that? I mean, sure, you can go ahead and do a plan, but I, I think sometimes there's a misconception in terms of what education experience is required to be able to carry out that position and and doing doing a, a training plan is really just a something that we do to push things aside is there another mechanism that we can use to actually speak to the position talk with you and, and make, make somebody understand why it's not as simple as just you know having a six-month plan to replace a person i think we have an opportunity to have some dialogue with that with the bsp board um I have some if that's an industry specific um issue or if it's a wider issue um around right six so no right six has come up as, as as one of the touch points um I share what we're trying to balance but there may be some way that we can mediate and, and get to have a meeting um, at some point just one quick one I just want to say um thank you for sharing all of the information it's incredibly helpful um I'd like to encourage if there's any possibility at all of giving Jeremy and his team support as it relates to expediting work permit grants. I'm part of a group of immigration service providers. We submit lots and lots of applications. Almost all of our clients are not submitting temporary applications because they're temporary positions. They're doing it because they cannot afford to wait five months. We can significantly reduce works workload by eliminating that entire temporary process, as um, you mentioned, if we could just get that processing time down to three or four weeks. Most clients are happy to wait three or four weeks, but it's the uncertainty of, I can't wait five months for an answer to relocate somebody. Most people would much prefer to have an annual permit than a temporary. They would like that security. Yeah. There are some that will do it temporary for a trial, you know, trying to find the app, but most don't want that. They don't want the extra cost. They're paying us as providers twice because they have to pay us to do the temporary and then pay us to do the grant. They don't want to do that, but they just can't wait. So yeah, I anything can do. I will ask that for you. <laughs> and the answer is going to scare you. Okay. Yeah. There was a time when you had a temporary, you had to leave the island at the end of that temporary. Yeah. And that behavior actually discouraged a lot of people from applying for temporaries. Yeah. The minute people realize that you can get up to six months in a temporary and they can quote unquote test drive these employees, mm -hmm. it became an issue. Now, if I sit, the fact that I can remind you of that. It means that that is something that actually has crossed my mind. But rather than go back to that quote unquote 
I don't need to say the and step, is we're going to wait to see where we get under accreditation, where we get under automation, and if it continues, because as it stands right now, the temporary is not the number one reason why the grants aren't actually now being delayed because it has literally clogged up the system. Yeah. Some months we have more temporary applications than we do in terms of um, work sure. for a grant. And again, we can only process what's being sent to us. Yeah. So what I can say to have the process also, only apply for a genuine temp if it's and if it's temporary. And secondly, get the paperwork right. Because I can tell you, we will get it. And the reason being, the reason being is that one thing that was under consideration, because there were there were times where I can tell as ministers of the as a minister being pressured by my colleagues in terms of work time. I'm like, guys, you know, I can reduce this right now. If the paperwork is incorrect, we can just turn it down. Yeah. It's been processed, a decision has been made, it's wrong, it's done, but that is not a business friendly environment. You know what I mean? So it is, and you see, what has happened with, um, with the COVID, or as I don't say, as a result of COVID, but a lot of businesses, like a small business, that used to use the professional services because of you know, financial constraints and everything, they started doing it themselves. And it's not as easy as it is that they wanted. That's the reason why we're pushing like crazy to get automated, where it can't be submitted until, because people talk about when they submitted it. What they don't tell people is that it's wrong when they submit it the first time. No, I and like that. I said, German team has gone above and beyond and said, without overtime too, to process these, put back to, you know, kind of build relationship with many people inside the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the reason we said, you know, let us look at automation, but in terms of hiring more people and so forth, and again, advance in the government, because I can tell you the size of the civil service and the growth in the size of the civil service it is growing faster than the private sector. And you can't have the, the, the base that is um, being taxed going at a slower rate than, than the tax and the arm entity. It, feels like, it, it yeah. feels like it's a short-term problem, though, because if we could just get the processing times down, then people wouldn't have... It's chicken and egg, right? Mm -hmm. We are having to continue to submit temporaries because of the, the long processing time on the grants. So we would love not to have to do that. Yeah. So, so, and then you come back afterwards again. Yeah. You come back three months or six months, then I clock up the system again. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm happy to say that the war team, even before our ministry wise, we did we really took it upon themselves to go through um, action points and pain points for them. And it even gets even worse than that because when you don't get your things on time, then you call in the call center factor, yeah. right? So they're looking to solve root cause issues, and one of them is yeah, we need to get caught up on on the grants and, and make that more efficient and more time. Well, I'm gonna leave you one that's impressive for me. You go in his office, he has this big monitor that all sits on it is his call center staff. <laughs> <laughs> I literally can't do it. I see that for myself. And he's like, this one has been answering this call all along. This one, we need to call it partner. Why this one? No, no, I'm telling you. So That's it at least makes me arm. But it is a lot of people. It's a lot of transaction. Like I said, five, six thousand decisions a month with around fifteen to twenty thousand touch points. Yeah, it is a lot, and we just have to go and get the process automated. Yeah, the customs is really. When they say that the customs, it was great. Yeah. Doing it, some free service. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd be happy to honestly. Like, if you need help, we'd be happy to pitch in and help. Yeah. The only thing I would say, and don't do this the wrong way, <laughs> the amount of energy being placed on fixing work permits and getting work permits through, sometimes I do wish that energy be matched. And upskilling our people, uplifting our people, and employing our people. But there is a mismatch. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, I am not, as a minister of labor, going to make it easier for work to be processed at the expense of people not being denied opportunities. Because I wish when I can come to some of these forums that people can take the time out to say, well, what is it that we can also do to help get some people employed and through the door? Because at the end of the day, I can tell you, if Every Cayman was employed, every workman would be, you know, because there'd be nobody out there left for us to check to see, can this person do the job or that person do the job? So as long as you have unemployed Cayman out there, the process is going to be slow. Yeah. If you employ all of them, then we know everybody's working, you can get an work if you want. Because guess what? We know there's nobody out there. So, everybody should be reaching out to employment services unit. They're absolutely fantastic. We do it for every client, every time that they're looking for somebody. 
as soon as they come to us and say, we're looking, sorry, Pam, Pam's stepping stone, if we go there, but again, is the first place to go to. If there is a qualified Caymanian or a suitable Caymanian or such Caymanian that can be trained, the team down there are fantastic. They will send you information about that Caymanian that you can interview and meet with. So please, everybody should be, should be doing that. Anyway, guys, I'm all right to catch. Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, like I said, we have no problem in trying to make ourselves accessible and available. Um, the program has made it clear in the manifesto that I'm improving the creative contract, and we'll have to do what we'll have to do in terms of get more involvement in the community groups and everything else and get the feedback. Thank you, DP. We appreciate you coming yeah. down, and we look forward to having you back again. Thank you. Uh,